Praise the Lord, church. Come on, come on, come on. Praise the Lord, church. One more time. Praise the Lord, church. Amen. God is good. And all the time, praise God. Truly, it's a blessing to be in the house of God on this another glorious, wonderful, beautiful Sabbath day. I greet you all in the precious name of Jesus. Jesus, the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus. Um, I know pastor's not here today, but pastor always asks, how has everybody's week been? And pastor's response to us is, it's always been for him a character-building week. Well, how many of you have had character-building weeks this week? Praise God. I know that all of our hands should be going up because we are being built in the character of Jesus Christ. But this week, I had one of the most experiencing character-building weeks. You see, have you ever helped someone or tried to help someone, and in the process of you helping someone, they look at you, they frown their face, they fuss at you, and they even cuss at you, and they even tell you, get away from me. You see, I work in a hospital, and I get to talk to people, and sometimes, because they have to wait so long to see the doctor, when it's time for me to talk to them, they're not too happy. They fuss, they holler, some of them even cuss at me. But what I simply do is say, thank you, God bless you. Now, I had a co-worker who looked at me and said, I don't know how you do it. Because if that was me, I would be like returning evil for evil. But when I see you, you always just say, thank you or God bless you. He said, how do you do it? What is it that you do? And when I look at him, I say, well, it's not me. I can't do anything. It's who is inside of me that does it. And when I hear him say, well, I wish I could be like that, I don't hear him say that. I interpret it as him saying, what must I do to be saved? Or what must I do to be like that? And when I think about that, I think about a gentleman in the Bible who asked that very same question. If you turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse number 30. In that, a jailer, a particular jailer, asked that same question. In Acts chapter 16, verse number 30, the jailer asked the question, and the scripture reads, and brought them out, them being Paul and Silas, he asked them this question. The jailer says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So if I had to place a title upon this message today, church, it's simply this. What must I do to be saved? If you will, pray with me, please. Oh, merciful and gracious God. We thank you, dear God, for this day in which you have made, and we do rejoice and are glad in it. Dear God, we thank you for continuing to bless us and keep us. And now, dear God, as we have come into your house and gathered in your name, we pray, dear God, that you will continue to speak to us. Yes, Lord, you've already spoken to us. You've spoken to us through prayer. You've spoken to us through song. You've spoken to us through music. You've spoken to us through testimonies. Now, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would continue to speak to us through your word. Dear God, you know that I don't have it, dear God. So I pray that you would utilize this vessel and speak through me, dear God. <laughs> Help me, dear God, to decrease while you increase. And dear God, as always, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. And it's in the precious name of Jesus the Christ that we pray. Our soul says, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, in order for us to understand why this jailer asked this particular question, we've got to go back to Acts chapter 16. And let's go back to Acts chapter 16, verse number 16. 
And in Acts chapter 16, if you're not familiar with this story, I'm quite sure most of you are, but for those who are not, we have Paul and Silas, and they're going about, and they are about to go into prayer. The scripture says, and it came to pass as we went to prayer that a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Now, when I look at that verse, I see that Paul and Silas are on their way to prayer, but they are stopped by a certain damsel who has a spirit of divination. How many of you know that divination is a spirit that is not of God? And how many of you know that one who does divination, they go into soothsaying? Soothsaying is simply fortune telling. And how many of you know that God tells us that we are not to have any part of that? No part of the, forth, of the fortune telling. I didn't say that, Brother Russell. The Word of God says it. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 10, 11, and 12, the Word of God says, There shall not be found among you any one that make of his son or daughter to pass through the fire, that useth divination or any observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirit or a wizard or a necrominer. For all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doeth drive them out from before thee. Now, I know that was a lot of reading, but I want you to remember one part of this. That God said that he would drive them out from before them. Those that do divination, those that do soothsaying and fortune telling, God said that he would drive them out. I want you to put that on the sticky side of your brain because I'm going to be back later and ask you to peel that off. Let's get back to Acts chapter 16 and let's continue with our story of Paul and Silas going into prayer. But it's one other thing I want to say about that. How many times do you know that when you're headed for prayer or that you're headed for service, how many of you know that the enemy will step in and try to stop you? The enemy will step in and try to stop you. You could be on your way to a Bible study, to a prayer service, or even to regular Sabbath service, and the enemy will do something to stop you or to try to stop you from arriving at your destination. Well, in Acts chapter 16, verse 17, it tells us that this same woman who had this divination spirit, this same woman who was doing soothsaying fortune telling in which God calls an abomination. It says that she followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, when I read that scripture, I got kind of puzzled because is that not what Paul and Silas were doing? Were they not showing people the way of salvation? So why would Paul be grieved or why would Paul be upset because of what this woman was doing? Well, in verse number 18, it tells us that this woman did this for many days and Paul was grieved and he turned and said to the spirit, before I go with what he said, I want you to go back to the sticky side of your brain and pull off what I asked you to remember. Remember what God said? God said that anyone that performs this divination, anyone that does this soothsaying, that he would drive them out. I want you to see what Paul did. It said, and this, this woman did for many days, but Paul being grieved, being upset, he was angry. He turned and said to the spirit, not to the woman, but to the spirit, what I want you to understand, family, is this. Mm. Sometimes it's not the individual. It's the spirit within the individual. Amen. 
See, sometimes we get to talking to the people who upset us. But really, it's not the people. It's the spirit inside the people. See, Paul turned. And Paul didn't speak to the woman. He spoke to the spirit. And he said, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. What did he command? For the spirit to come out. What did God say that he would do to those who, put, who speak divination, who speak soothsaying? He said, I will drive them out. So what did Paul do? Paul did exactly what God said that he would do. He said, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And the scripture says, and he came out that same hour. Now, verse number 19 and 20. The word of God says, and when her masters saw that the hope of their gains were gone. Let me ask you this question. If you are making money, and you're making profit, and then someone decides to stop your money from being made, somebody stops your money maker, and when they stop your money maker, you get a little upset because you done cut my funds off now. You done stopped my money from coming in. So these masters who had this woman with divination out there working, out there doing fortune telling, out there making money for them, the word of God says that they got a little upset. They got so upset that they took Paul and Silas and they took them to the marketplace. Now the marketplace, let me tell you, it's not a place where you go to the store at. You know how we say I'm going to the market. No, this was like a thoroughfare. This was like a place where the rulers and the magistrates hang out. So they took them to the rulers. And in verse number 20 it says, and they brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. What did Paul and Silas do to trouble the city? Sometimes when we're doing God's work, sometimes people will lay false charges on us. People will lay false charges on us when we're about our father's business. Verse number 21 says, these charges, they continue to be false. They said, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude believed those lies. And they rose up together against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates rent their clothes and commanded to beat them. Paul and Silas doing God's work, being about their father's business. They get taken brought to court, get lied upon, get whipped, and get beaten. It says this, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them in the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Now this jailer, who having received the charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet into stocks. Now, I don't know if anybody's been in prison before, but let me tell you, it's not a happy place to be. And not only were they lied on, not only was false charges brought on them, not only were they stripped of their clothes, not only were they whipped and were they beaten, they was also put in the prison. And then it says they were put in the inner prison. In other words, they were put in the worst part of the prison. For today, some people call that lockup where you're placed in the worst part of the prison. And to make matters even worse, they even put chains on their feet. Let me tell you, I don't know about you, church, but if something like that was to happen to someone that I know, let me say that it's not of God, and they got lied on, they got brought before court, they got whipped, they got beaten, they got placed in jail and placed in the inner part and then placed chains on their feet. Wouldn't that have you thinking that they would be a little upset? They would be a little mad. They would be a little angry. 
And wouldn't that be one of the darkest times of their life? In Acts chapter 16, verse number 25, the word of God says, and at midnight. I want to stop there before we go any further. Midnight. Now, I know midnight could be the darkest time of the night, the darkest time of any day. But sometimes midnight can be the darkest time of your life. When things have been going not well with you, when the bills can't get paid, when the children are getting on your last nerve, when things are not going well at the job, when trouble happens in the family, that could be a midnight for you. Paul and Silas were experiencing a midnight in their life. They'd been lied on. They'd been brought to court. They'd been sentenced. They've been beaten. They've been placed in jail for what? Doing God's work, showing people the way of salvation. The scripture says at midnight, at midnight, what would you do if everything was going wrong in your life? At midnight, would you start fussing? At midnight, would you start hollering? At midnight, would you start screaming? At midnight, would you curse everyone out? Ah, not Paul and Silas. The scripture says, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. It says that at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. Now, I'm not quite sure what those songs was. Maybe Paul and Silas sang a song like, Trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. So much trouble. I have to cry sometimes. I lay awake at night. But I tell you that be all right. Cause I know Jesus. Yes. He'll fix it after a while. Or, or maybe they sang this song. Pass me not, O gentle behavior. Hear my humble cry. Why on others thou art calling? Do not pass me by. Come on, you know the chorus. I'm singing, Savior. Come on, Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not. Do not pass me by. Now, I don't know what song Paul and Silas sang, and I also know they prayed, but I want you to pay attention to the last part of that verse. It says, and the prisoners heard them. Now, once again, I want you to take that and put it on the sticky side of your brain because we're going to come back a little later and peel that off too. But at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the other prisoners heard them. And how many of you know that when the praises go up, the blessings come down? How many of you also know that God answers prayers? Can, any, can I get a witness to somebody that knows that God answers prayers? If God has answered a prayer in your life, let me see your hand in the air. Praise the Lord. Now, if God has answered more than one prayer in your life, let me see two hands go up. Praise the Lord. God hears and he answers prayers. In verse number 26 of Acts chapter 16, the word of God says, and suddenly, no, it didn't say slowly. It didn't say hesitantly. It said suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. <clears throat> Let me say that again because I don't think somebody understood it. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. 
Paul and Silas were suffering midnight. They were placed in prison. Prison that was made by man. But God, but God, he sent an earthquake and it shook not the prison, but the foundation of the prison. You see, man made the prison. The prison sits on the foundation. God went underneath their problems and shook what was underneath it. I'm here today to tell you, family, whatever you may be going through, whatever problems you may be having, God can go underneath your problems and shake the very core of what's there. As long as you still are in Christ, I'm letting you know that God can shake anything that man throws on you. The scripture says that, and suddenly there was an earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. And this is the part that I need you to go back. All right? I asked you to put something on the sticky side of your brain. And that was the last verse. It said, and the prisoners heard them. What I want you to understand is Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises, but the prisoners heard them. Let me say it again. <laughs> Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises, and the prisoners of the prisoners heard them. What I'm trying to tell you, church, is this. Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. The other prisoners, they didn't sing. They didn't pray, but they just heard. The scripture says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. Now listen to this, church. And immediately all the doors, not just Paul and Silas' door, not just Paul and Silas' door, but all the doors were open and all the bands were loose. Let me tell you, church, the other prisoners, they didn't sing. They didn't pray. All they did was listen. And guess what happened? God overflowed the blessing. So that tells me this. The next time you in service and somebody praising God and somebody saying hallelujah or somebody getting their prayer on, don't you move away from them. They getting ready to get a blessing. You need to step closer to them. So when that blessing come down, it'll flow down on you. God is good. The scripture says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. But then we got a problem because we got a jailer who was involved in the beating of Paul and Silas. We got a jailer who went afterwards and took a nap. And it says, and the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep because he was knocked out. He knew they were secure. I ain't got nothing to worry about. I'll see them the next day. It says, and the keeper of the prison are waking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open. Okay, now he got a problem. He's got a problem. He drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. Now, this is when I ask the question, why would the jailer do that? If the prisoners are gone, why would he try to kill himself? Well, if you are familiar with Roman custom, Roman custom is this. If you are placed in charge of a prisoner, and if that prisoner happens to escape, then that means that's your life. That means they will take your life. So instead of him allowing them to take his life, he decided to take his own life, thinking that all the prisoners had escaped. But how many of you know that we serve a God who can save anybody? In Acts chapter 16, verse 28 and 29, Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Do thyself no harm. So in other words, God used Paul to save the life of a jailer. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. God used Paul to save the life of someone that did him wrong. God used Paul to save a life of someone who beat him, who whipped him, who placed him in jail, who had his feet placed in chains. But God used Paul to save that person. And it's something else that I thought about when I read this story. If the prison doors were open and it was dark in the prison, And the jailer 
didn't see the prisoners. And he supposed that they were gone. So he took a sword and wanted to kill himself. But Paul, being in that same darkness, was able to look and see that the jailer was about to kill himself. What's that telling me, family? What's that telling me is this, that when you have Jesus in your life, when you have the light of God within you, even in the darkness of your life, he will allow you to see what's coming your way. See, the jailer didn't have him in there. He couldn't see through the darkness thinking that the prisoners were escaped. But Paul, being in that same darkness because of the light that was in him, was able to see that the jailer was about to kill himself. Let me tell you something about our God. He's an awesome God who reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God, and he will save. He will save. In verse number 29, after the jailer heard Paul say that, he called for a light. Now he can see, because now he's got some light. And he came in, and he was trembling. And the word of God says that he fell down before Paul and Silas. I tell you, our God is an awesome God. In Acts number 16, verse 30, and this is, was our scriptural text. And this is why that jailer asked that question. He brought Paul and Silas out, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Why? Because he witnessed <laughs> what Paul and Silas had done. Brother Russell mentioned something about it earlier. When he was talking about a sermon, he said, not her a sermon, but be a sermon. And that's what we need to go out here to do. Not only speak the word of God, but live the word of God. Sometimes they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Woo! Let me say that again. Sometimes they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And Paul and Silas answered that man's question. Paul and Silas said, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. You want to save your house? Do you want to save your house? Then believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And just as Paul and Silas was singing and praying and praising God, and all the prisoners' bonds and doors were open and their chains came off, you get to singing in your house. You get to praying in your house. And you tell me, won't everything start falling off? I keep telling you our God is an awesome God. Yeah, he's a saving God. He saved Paul and Silas out of prison. He saved those other prisoners who could have escaped, but they didn't. And that's simply amazing. You tell me what jail doors wouldn't be open and chains wouldn't fall off and those prisoners wouldn't run out. That can't be nothing but God. That's God and God all by himself. But I'm telling you, it's that way of salvation. What must I do to be saved? Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Someone else explained it like this to me. Because sometimes we get so big-headed that we think we did it on our own. <laughs> That's when you're really fooling yourself. That's when you're tricking yourself. And I don't know if you ever tricked yourself before, but you can fall off. The word, the word says this. Salvation is the work of God's grace by which he pardons us for our sins and bestows upon us the gift of eternal life. Nothing that we do. It's all about God. And it's all about our faith in him. Salvation is the work of God's grace. By grace are ye saved through faith. It is a gift of God, nothing of our own. Grace, in case some of you are not familiar with grace, grace is what God gives us that we don't deserve. Now, some people get it mixed up with mercy. Mercy is what God withholds from us 
what we do deserve. And I'm telling you, God's grace is by what we are saved. His par- he pardons of us our sins, and he gives us the gift of eternal life. I think Elder Russell mentioned it a little earlier when he said, John 3, 16, and I'm quite sure we all know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. So, church, if you want salvation, you must have Jesus Christ. You must have the son. And how do I know that? Because in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, the word of God reads this. And this is the record that God have given to us, eternal life. And life is in his son. He that have the son have life. He that have not the son of God have not life. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in him. And believe me, church, you too will know that our God is an awesome God. Family, I leave you as I came, giving all praise, glory, and honor to our Savior and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.